I come to you in the name of one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. So on this Trinity Sunday, I want to start by going back to what now seems like ancient history. Not to the arguments of Erasian and Tertullian, but to a time when I was in about fifth or sixth grade and somehow convinced my mother to take me to the shop that repaired our lawnmower. And there we purchased for about $5 a single cylinder Tecumseh engine. It was only $5 because it didn't work. And this was the type of engine that if it actually worked, that you carefully and with a touch of magic adjusted the choke and the throttle settings and then repeatedly pulled the starter cord with hopes that the engine would sputter and cough and ultimately spring to life. And then you could cut the grass. I suspect my mother was willing to part with her $5 for this non-working engine because it meant that I would not tear apart our working lawnmower to see what made it work. And armed with my father's hopeless assortment of tools, I began to disassemble this engine to see what made it run or not run. With time, a few busted knuckles and grease-stained clothes, I could soon identify many of the hidden parts of the engine, the piston, the valves, the valve springs, rods, bearings, all became familiar to me. Now keep in mind this engine is as simple as it gets. A single cylinder, a carburetor, no fancy fuel injection or oil cooling. It actually had a paddle that hung from the crankshaft and splashed the oil in the pan to keep everything lubricated. I never got that engine to run. But I did learn how engines work, sort of. I could point to the carburetor or the pistons and valves and share their role in the whole process of internal combustion engines. But really, some of it was still a mystery. If the fuel-air mixture, thanks to the carburetor, was put in the cylinder head, and thanks to the spark plug, there was a resulting explosion that pushed the cylinder downward, well, how was the explosion enough? And not too much. Why did the engine run versus becoming shrapnel? That was the first engine that I tore down, but not the last. And I'm okay that it's still a bit of a mystery. Some mysteries are intended to be solved, and others are intended to be accepted as just mysterious marvels. Holy mysteries are in that latter category. It's okay that we can't fully explain the Holy Trinity. It is and shall remain beyond us. The mystery doesn't make the Trinity any less real or any less of a blessing in our lives. We're baptized in the name of the Trinity, and through that baptism, we are endowed with the Holy Spirit and sent into the world. The Colic tells us, Almighty and everlasting God, you have given to us, your servants, grace by the confession of a true faith to acknowledge the glory of the eternal Trinity and in the power of your divine majesty to worship the unity. A true faith founded in the glory of the eternal Trinity that we worship in unity. We can point to the parts and pieces, much like I could identify the valves and piston. We can identify Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. How it works is a holy mystery. What we receive is a true faith found in the unity of the Trinity. And that's all the truth we need. There's a famous line from the movies and perhaps you remember Jack Nicholson screaming, you can't handle the truth. When it comes to the Trinity, we don't need to know the truth as it pertains to how it works. 
just that it does work. In the holy mystery that is the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are both three persons and one essence. They're both unique and the same. It's a holy mystery that has created us, reveals God to us, and empowers us. It's a mystery in which we can rest in comfort. So it should be no surprise to those that have been around our associate, Mother Siobhan, for any length of time. She's a major supporter of the Pauline fan club. St. Paul is a favorite of hers. And with her out of town, I have the opportunity to question a bit of Paul's logic here. St. Paul tells us that we boast in our sufferings, and by his logic, suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, and character produces hope. If that's the case, Paul, then we are overflowing with hope. By his logic, we are well past filled to the brim with hope. We are a veritable geyser of hope. As we're suffering, the earth and all of humanity are suffering under the weight of climate change. We're suffering under the weight of unjust wars, unjust violence, and needless deaths. We're suffering under the weight of discrimination and divisiveness. God's people and God's creation are suffering. And it doesn't seem, as Paul would suggest, that we're so full of hope. When I was young and took that old engine apart, I didn't know which tolerances were important and what parts could just be bolted on without much care. I couldn't see both the big picture and the details. As much as I knew what I was looking at, I didn't know what I was looking for. And perhaps that's where we are too. Paul tries to redeem himself and ends this pericope by saying, hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. We're filled with hope at baptism and that hope is renewed as we worship God, as we share in the Eucharist, as we witness God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit at work in the world. I had the opportunity a while ago to watch a video of a time-lapse photo sequence that featured the effects of a wildfire. The photographer had set up a time-lapse camera, and fortuitous or not, a wildfire came through. The camera survived the fire and continued to create images of the scene. The first images were of a lush green forest. And then came the great destruction of the wildfire. And the next sequence was the blackened and charred remains of the forest floor. And then finally, we saw glimmers of hope. Small green plants poking through the ashes. The forest regenerated. The forest, after its death, came back to life. This is how it works. God always gets the last word. Satan tormented Job, but God got the last word and made Job whole. Satan tested Jesus in the desert, but God got the last word and sent the angels to minister to Jesus. Abraham and Sarah had no children, but God got the last word. And their offspring are as numerous as the stars in the sky. Jesus is crucified, dies, and is buried. And God says, no, death does not get the last word. Death shall not win. And Jesus breaks the bonds of death, ascending to heaven 
to sit at the right hand of God. Hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit brings to us the truth, the truth that Christ is the unique revelation of God who speaks the word of God and brings to fulfillment all the promises of Scripture. And therein lies our hope, hope in the glorious Trinity. I leave you with a favorite prayer of mine to let us pray. Risen Lord, give us a heart for simple things, love, laughter, bread, wine, and dreams. Fill us with green growing hope and make us an Easter people whose song is Alleluia, whose sign is peace, and whose name is love. Amen.